ladies and gentlemen, while the world is still in the process of recovering from the COVID-19, the economic impact and the energy crisis resulting from the Russian-Ukrainian war is significantly impacting us as well as Sydney. It seems that we nowadays have several open challenges and issues. Some of these include geopolitics, the impact of the war in Ukraine on shipping trading patterns and energy routes, the energy crisis and its effect on shipping and the world, the EU sanctions for Russia as well as the effect on European shipping, regulations, the ever-evolving environmental regulation and the decarbonization mandate and its challenges. There are also some ones developing Regarding new technologies and digitalization on board, the reskill of the existing manpower and the operational optimization that looks like they will change and they will transform shipping industry in the future. And last one, the one that Graham gave major uh, importance, the ESG principle in shipping. Historically, the shipping industry has been proven flexible, resilient, adaptable to the political and geopolitical challenges, and that it has come out rather rewarding. But to hear more on the current issue challenges and suggested or adaptive solution, I will turn to my panelists now, and I will start with Anthony. What I consider the hottest topic today, not only in shipping but worldwide, is the energy crisis and the possible effect on shipping and how it will be developed uh, in, in the future. So Anthony, what would you say? Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here on this panel today. Uh, but I will turn directly to the question because we don't have uh, many hours, we have a few minutes to address quite a complex issue. So I think we have, in reality, we have two crises, not one. We have two energy crises, one which is the one we all see, and I will not spend a lot of time on that. And the next crisis, the looming crisis, which we are also seeing, but we are not really addressing and I think it's a very important one. The first one, of course, has to do with the russian ukrainian war, it has to do with COVID, financial crisis, interest rates, foreign exchange uh, rates, uh, the looming recession, recession, inflation, cost inflation for shipping uh, costs, etc., etc. And of course, the disruption in trade flows that stem from all of the above plus the disruption in investment patterns that will lead to tomorrow's disruptions in commodities, in energy, etc., etc. So I think we should focus, however, on the second crisis. The second crisis has, is a crisis of energy in the world economy at large. I would not focus <coughs> on the single issue of what are our ships going to carry in the future, or what our ships are going to burn as bunkers in the future. Because this is not an exclusively shipping problem. We are not going to solve the problem of fueling our ships just ourselves. We are going to use the same fuel as everybody else in the world economy. And that's a very important factor to take into account. Are thinking about ammonia, for example, which I don't support personally. But people are saying, ammonia, okay, let's use ammonia on our ships. Where are we going to source the ammonia for our ships? Unless the rest of the economy also uses ammonia. Or H2, hydrogen, in famous forms. Unless the world economy sources H2 somewhere. So it's not an exclusively uh, shipping problem. And that problem, I am afraid, is not being, uh, doesn't, let me, let me rephrase that. I don't see a path to resolve that problem today. 
we were in New York with uh, Ian Bilderman and many others and uh, Nicholas Borbonnots, and we discussed this issue. I don't see that. This is a real challenge. And at the same time, we have, and I will close my remark with that, we have a looming deadline on 2050. It's not too far away, because the ships we are going to order today, if anybody orders the ships, the ship which is going to be ordered today will be delivered in 2026, and that ship will reach very close to the 2050 deadline. And you may in fact find yourself ordering a ship today, and that ship when in 2013 may be obsolete, technologically obsolete, because you may have opted for a kind of fuel which is not really the fuel which is in fashion in 2030 when your ship will be only four years old. Thank you. This is a very important issue, and indeed, and I'm sure the class reps, uh, they will uh, enlighten us uh, uh, later on. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, except if uh, anyone, uh, George or uh, Paolo or Maria, you would like to add a, a quick uh, comment here on the energy crisis set up. Uh, otherwise, we'll move to the next uh, level. OK, every, everybody well? Good. So here it is. The fuel of the future and what we do with that. But the fuel of the future is one thing. But on today, though, this EU sanctions uh, that uh, have changed a lot of the perspective of cargoes, etc., have an effect in shipping, in principle. So, George, since I know you, this is a favorable uh, issue for you, what would you say? Thank you very much, uh, Michali. Thank you, Captain Link. This is a great pleasure to be here today to to express my views as well on uh, various topical issues. Sanctions. Obviously, the only weapon that we have against a belligerent power, a peaceful weapon against a belligerent power. Um, Gandhi did the peaceful strikes. It's the same sort of thing. But I think we, we tactically, we do it wrong. We don't start with light sanctions and then get more heavy as the time goes on. Because you give the belligerent power time to find solutions and way around sanctions, which they have. You're not allowed to transport something which is a unit price over 300 euros. So a 10,000 euro haute couture dress cannot leave Paris for Moscow directly. So the oligarch will have to pay an extra $300 for it to go via Shanghai or another nation which is not supporting the European Union. So did we solve the problem? Did we solve the problem by changing the sanctions every two weeks and catching loaded ships? with sanctioned cargo on board on their way to Russia. Don't forget, sanctions are supposed to penalize the powers that be and not the people in the street. And unfortunately, when you stop a cargo of things below 300, items below 300 euros, you're actually penalizing the man in the street, who is not the person who is going to war or has made a decision to go to war. Another major issue with sanctions is, and we, we had a chance with the Union of Greek Ship Owners, the Hellenic Chamber of Shipping, to speak to uh, Ambassador O'Brien, who leads the sanctions in the State Department. And we said, you've got to be able to be co coordinated. The UK, the United States, and the EU must have similar sanction rules. It is exceptionally difficult to go through different, three different regulations and find out which cargoes can and cannot go to the people of Russia who did not start this war. But they find other solutions. Today, no more cargoes go to Novorossiysk because it's in the Black Sea, which is one of the major Russian import ports in our area, because they go to Poti. And then from Poti, they're taken by coasters up to Novorossiysk or by truck. We have circumvented all the sanctions. We must find other ways, either get strict right at the beginning or find another way against or to put pressure on a belligerent power. Thank you. Thank you, John. Anthony, would you like on the global maritime? You are involved in the yes. aspect of this. Uh, I think I'm not uh, expressing the global maritime for 
here because and there's, there are many reasons. One of them is sitting over there. You have the chair. Okay. We <laughs> 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 did not to speak for the forum himself. However, I do agree that sanctions have a meaning only if they apply consistently and worldwide. Haphazard and uh, uh, not completely applicable sanctions simply don't work. And we find that ourselves in our daily lives. And we, we are, of course, and I'm sure George and everyone here uh, applies the sanctions and apply the law. However, as George mentioned, the law changes every day, and we are not sure what is the interpretation. And then you have, for example, uh, just a practical thing. We have, okay, you have a, a cargo which you know is not sanctioned, and then your ship is not insured. Because London and reinsurance and the writers will not insure the whole machinery. Although this, the cargo itself is okay. And they accept it's okay, but they say, well, we will not be sure. So this is a problem, and that problem impacts the consumer at the end of the day. Indeed. Since we started with the energy crisis and uh, looking for the fuel of the future, as you know, in January 2023, we'll see the first major impact of uh, IMOS environmental regulation. So next to me is Mathieu de Tuny, who will update us on the progress, the, on the decarbonization effort, the current issues, the solution in assisting ship owners, and perhaps the fuel of the future. If you can, uh, <laughs> I gave you the most difficult. No, I don't have any crystal ball, of course. <laughs> yes, I, I think we, we progress. Uh, we all know the uh, strategic goals of the IMO and the corresponding uh, measures. I mean the short-term measures, including uh, EI, EXI, CII, and the ECMP for 2023. So it's coming soon. This is tomorrow. Then we have the uh, mid-term uh, measures to incentivize, you know, the uh, greenhouse gas reduction, and ultimately the uptake for low, uh, low uh, carbon uh, uh, fuel. And the third uh, and uh, long-term measures for the zero carbon, you know, for the second part of the, of the center. So we progress with these measures, but I think in other respect, there are some uh, legitimate uh, concerns uh, as we speak today, in the sense that uh, we, we don't know how fast we shall go and, uh, you know, uh, how we can achieve uh, the IMO goals on time. What do I mean here? Uh, if we just take the example of the CII, so the short-term measure, uh, what about you know uh, beyond 2026 and the decreasing uh, factors, as you know? Regarding the mid-term measures, we know that uh, in terms of visibility for the shipping industry, there is a need about the uh, market-based measurement systems, you know, carbon levy or, uh, you know, ETS or whatever, but what about this, you know? Which is a concern, of course. And third, probably most importantly, and this is a topic that Anthony addressed, uh, we have been talking a lot about uh, uh, time to wake, but probably the debate should be more about, you know, the way to wake. This is something uh, which is, I think, uh, seriously addressed now by the uh, Poseidon Principles. We had a declaration last week on that topic. Mm -hmm. I think it was raised as well during the Global Maritime Forum. I think uh, Europe is adding a strong focus on that, you know, with the fuel uh, ma EU maritime. So that's probably the main topic we should talk about because shipping industry wants all, I think, this issue. Uh, it's definitely, you know, uh, 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 an energy uh, transition problem that all the industries, you know, should focus on. So it's not a negative note at all, because uh, I'm very uh, optimistic, maybe by nature, but, but not only, because there are a lot of uh, initiatives today. This is why I do think that we progress. As a class society, we receive, you know, on a daily basis, a lot of requests for uh, 
you know, GDP, job development program, uh, job industry programs, request for approval of principle for new technologies. You know? New technologies, but as well more uh, things related to performance efficiency as a grand uh, you know, highlight in this keynote. So, a lot of things happening. Uh, I think class society have a vital role here. Uh, so that's why, again, I'm pretty uh, optimistic. Thank you, even though by talking to several shipping executives, they tell me that they are very reluctant to invest on uh, any of these non-proven yet new buildings, because as Anthony said, maybe in 10 years your vessel is obsolete and you don't know what to do with that, having spent a few hundred millions on those. So, uh, Paolo. Yeah, yes, yes, of course, of course. I'd like to have a comment here. Uh, I don't think it's an important distinction. We are talking about the zero carbon, and that is wrong. I think we should be talking about zero emissions. Carbon is not the sole greenhouse gas. There are other greenhouse gases that are uh, equally, if not more bad. We have lead nitrogen oxide, we have sulfur oxide, we have particulate matter. So we should be talking about zero emissions in our plan to reach the target of 2050. Zero emissions, not zero carbon. Zero carbon is a misnomer and leads us potentially to the wrong path. We all understand we need CO2. If we have zero CO2, all our plants will die. So we, we do need CO2 in the world. And it's not enough what we breathe out. But isn't it, for me it's always been very strange, and I think we got it wrong from the beginning. We targeted the ship owner to find the solution. In any other industry, let's take the car industry, which is the other greatest consumer of fuel in the world. When we had leaded fuel, the fuel manufacturers were instructed to produce new fuel and cars were, manufacturers were instructed to build new cars. When we came to tier three, they didn't go to the driver and say, you will be penalized if your car is in tier three. They made the car manufacturer build a tier three car. Here, the ship owner is being penalized because the oil majors cannot produce a carbon-free fuel and engine manufacturers can't produce an engine that will not produce emissions. But to top it all off, the politicians can't decide which of the fuels we're going to use to be able to design the engines, find the investment, and build the ships. Thank you. As you can see, it is very worthy that you came very early here <laughs> to attend this uh, session. And uh, Paolo, your perspective. Well, my perspective. Let me just elaborate on what has been already said because I think a lot of things has been already put on the table. I was very inspired by Graham here addressing a note about the global safety and the fact that we have to act as a group, but also Anthony, you mentioned correctly that we are not the one that will have to solve this issue of the decarbonization. It's a sort of work on the safety as a group, but work on this topic as a sort of ecosystem involving all of the parts of the chain, so from the, the energy producer, the transport, the storage, uh, and, and the utility. Uh, think, for example, uh, Georgia, you mentioned CO2. We know very well that uh, the power industries are short to decarbonize in the next decades. So we need carbon capture because it's the proven technology is the one that is ready to take the CO2. It is the one that could produce blue hydrogen for future applications. Uh, and definitely, it is also something that could be used for producing synthetic fuels or even in a very small and pure quantities for, for food. So this is an example on how there is a need by the industry out of there. And we know that uh, this has become a sort of uh, already opportunity because we know there are on orders uh, uh, very big uh, uh, liquefied uh, uh, CO2 carriers. So I think that uh, in particular for, uh, for the long-term measures, uh, as a class society, apart from our traditional role as uh, uh, regulators, uh, 
we have to be more and more uh, uh, trusted partners and technology partners because uh, groups like RINA but also BV, of course, we have the opportunity to work with other industries and to understand where they are working. The steel manufacturer industry will need hydrogen for sure together with gas. We still need gas because there is no other solution for doing uh, a, a sustainable approach for the production of iron with the, the deducted, uh, reducted iron and plus uh, the, these new electric furnaces that we know. So in the future, hydrogen could be there together with LNG. So definitely we, we must have uh, this uh, um, attention and we must be involved more and more uh, in the cross-fertilization from, uh, from uh, other industry. But, and then maybe we will talk about this later on, we also must be able to, to make a decision now, scalable will be decision now, for those who want to order a ship now and have it sailing in 15, 20 years. But uh, just for clarification, if somebody comes with half a billion to you and say, I would like your opinion to invest in shipping, <laughs> well, what, what do you do say? You say, I need my return on equity and all of that, on investment, do you have a an answer. Good bank, good bank. Do you have an answer? Well, I think that uh, I'm still convinced that uh, uh, LNG, for example, could be still considered a transition fuel. And uh, for example, it could be coupled with a carbon capture reforming solution to generate directly hydrogen on board for a combustion site. This liquefied carbon capture being stored on board and then being marketed outside and given because there will be definitely a market. So I would say that uh, a modular, uh, uh, a scalable solution uh, could be still now to invest on gas, uh, on new concept of course of energy efficient ships, uh, with the possibility by 2030 to install uh, devices uh, and uh, have the possibility for example of producing on board uh, uh, hydrogen and even to install uh, uh, fuel cells. I think that uh, this is, if there will be synthetic method, uh, gas, the ship will be ready, of course. So this might be, if I have to choose tomorrow, uh, this might be, let's say, uh, an option to a traditional vessel, like somebody is, uh, is still thinking, but that to me is not, uh, is not viable. Or uh, alternatively, uh, we are looking with a certain uh, attention to methanol again. Still starting from the point that, uh, from the technological point of view, fuel cells uh, might be something that we will find on our ships in the near side. Yeah. This, this, uh, this is a very good uh, discussion we're having here, but uh, I, I hate to point out that a lot of what you're saying is not zero carbon. Methanol has carbon, biofuels have carbon, keep producing. Uh, CO2 and other of course stuff. So the question is, first of all, to produce methanol in a sustainable and totally from yeah. weight to well to weight. Yeah. But that's that's again that's another challenge. Yes, yes, yes. But of course, as we said, we will need to, to go by step. So there will be a transition, a step in which we will more work more on the carbon neutrality, and then uh, we will go more and more. Uh, hopefully with uh, some, uh, let's say, zero emission solutions, but of course it's something that cannot be done. Uh. But what I like about this is the fact that it is, first of all, transition, which means that there's not going to be a huge disruption in the existing patterns, because it's retrofitting existing ships uh, that can have a carbon capture, uh, like a scrubber, for example, on the ship, and that is something which will not scrap 70,000 ships in yeah. one but, yeah. and go. For existing ships is one thing, but then if you have, a, if you have LNG on board, LNG has this uh, opportunity of having also H in its molecule, and in the, in the industry, I'm sure, they are already doing this. They are using, let's say, steam reformer just to use the cryogenic uh, properties of, uh, let's say, of the <coughs> LNG to produce hydrogen and liquefied CO2. So if we start, as I said before, with the idea that in the future there will be a market for CO2 carriage for various industries for uh, deploying it uh, in, uh, let's say, exhausted wells, uh, then ships carrying liquefied CO2, people say, what do you do with this liquefied CO2? There will be a market. There will be a market, and you will produce hydrogen on board without the logistical strain, and you will deliver your liquefied CO2 somewhere. There are 
plenty of studies nowadays in North Europe and US about uh, terminals for the storage, uh, the liquefaction and handling of CO2. Not yet. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just to remind some facts, maybe uh, today there is only uh, one solution you know, which is available on the market as part of the transition, which is the LNG as fuel. Uh, we, uh, we now are having you know, some, uh, let's say, return of experience after one year of exploration of the first uh, dual fuel vessels, notably for the container ships, and the, the results are there. It's a greenhouse gas reduction of about between 23 and 28 percent. So it's part of the transition. And we all know that that term, it won't be one solution. There will be several solutions on the market, depending, of course, on the trading patterns of the vessels, <laughs> depending, of course, on the type of the vessels, and so on and so on. So my recommendation, back to your initial question, how is this is a flexibility. Flexibility, and this is as well what Paolo said, to make sure that along the lifespan cycle of the vessel, you're able to adapt you know, the propulsion systems to the evolution of the technologies and meet, of course, the requirements. So we may see <coughs> quite flexible ships in the future, right? that they can do different things or plant different fuels. That would be quite possible. Anyway, on the side effect of this uh, industry, shipping industry transformation, is the transformation of its manpower. If you go to digitize ship, what do you do with the proof? This, it will take a long time in, to pick up. So, Mathieu, from your perspective, since you may have experience already, what would you say, how challenging this will be? I think that uh, running the Skinner said a lot about it, you know, sustainability and uh, safety. Well, uh, I think it's important to put uh, the, the safety at the hub of everything. Uh, I mean, both for sustainability and uh, digitalization. Sustainability, because we are talking about safety, so it's important that uh, we, we are sure that the crew, you know, will be involved, you know, uh, in the definition of the solution. And I don't forget, you know, the digitalization as well, uh, which is very important, you know, in this journey to make sure there is a dialogue. So that, that's uh, definitely, uh, I think, uh, at the heart, you know, our development, even us as a class society, you know, uh, for the surveyors. We are on a learning curve, you know, we talked about LNG as fuel. So it was a new fuel for us as well, you know, as a fuel. So there is a learning curve. We try now to build on that. It's a kind of momentum now to review uh, the potential of the new fuels, ammonia, hydrogen, and so on. And we need, a, we need new skills in the company. Now we used to have some uh, naval architects, uh, you know, uh, ex uh, uh, sea uh, pharaohs, but now we need, uh, chemi we need chemical people, we need uh, IT people, you know, for cyber uh, topics. So uh, for us as a class society, I think it's a wonderful, uh, you know, opportunity uh, to value more the engineering profiles in the company that have done so far. Okay, very good. Uh, Paolo, would you like a word? I think that uh, what you mentioned about uh, the new technologies that will be on board and, and the issues that uh, we pose to prove is something that we have to keep in mind. But I think that we also have to keep in mind that if we will evolve with new technologies, with zero emission, also we could think that it will change also the way we will operate our companies. I, as class society, is from 1861, that uh, on the survey side is more or less working in the same way. Uh, I don't know if I will retire with uh, having always the surveyor going on board with the same periodicity and doing the same things. Uh, it might be that with this digitalization, the connection, the telemetric approach, we will have uh, a different way to perform service. The same things also for the role of the superintendent, the same thing for the role of the crew. So there might be a moment in which with all this digitalization, we, I, I'm not talking about remote uh, or uh, unmanned, but having a specialized team at the shore, having, uh, let's say, the specialist, the manufacturer of the engines taking care of the big stuff, uh, and then the, the crew on board uh, steering the ship uh, and taking care of the ordinary maintenance. This is a scenario that I think uh, might be futuristic and, 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 and real. Thank you. So what we have seen up to now that a lot of 
components, they need to be put together in order to make progress on zero emissions by 2050. Then I left for last the question of ESG that Graham paid uh, uh, quite a good portion of his time. And I left it because I was intrigued by the Texas State Railroad Commissioner who stated and wrote to President Biden that ESG has taken 90% of investment off the table for reliable energy over the last five years and may put an end to the oil and gas industry in Texas. That is the Texas State Railroad Commission. So Anthony, we start with you, we we'll finish with you. Beneficial ESG, beneficial detrimental or just a nice manual, a manual report? Well, it's, uh, certainly it's not just a manual. It is certainly something which is beneficial and it is a necessity. It is beneficial and a necessity. Okay? So I'm not distinguishing between them. What I would like to focus is on in social, in the S, there is not just social, there is also safety and sustainability. And that's very important. So when we're talking about, for example, a fuel for the future, we have to take into account very seriously the safety of the crew, of the ship, the safety of the bunkering barge, the safety of the environment in general around the area where the bunkering operations happen. And the other thing is sustainability. So we're talking about fuels. These fuels have to be sustainable, not just zero emissions as I said at the beginning. And the other thing that I'd like to, to, to say is that we cannot plan, again, I'm repeating myself, we cannot plan about ESG and move from aspirational to practical if we do not have visibility. And the visibility has to come from the governments and the regulators. Uh, Paolo. I think it's for sure beneficial also because uh, to me there is a market trend that cannot be stopped. There is the consumer perception, uh, in particular, I would say in the young generation, we see it every day with our HR department when we interview uh, new employees uh, and uh, if you want also to attract talents, you need to have that. So there is a, a requirement from the market. We already saw some statement about Amazon, Ikea, this giant, uh, that they will ask uh, for sustainable ships, ships that uh, Will need, they will need to show at the end of the day, also on, the, on their tickets, on the paper, what they are really doing and giving evidence. So uh, things uh, must be measurable with measurable KPI. And this is one of the important things that also the EU directive, the taxonomy directive, is bringing on the table. So for us, it's uh, substantial because there is the investments more and more, there is the perception of the consumer of the market, and there is also the set of regulations in particular. Yeah. I will, uh, I will even uh, push further. I think it's a management tool. It's a management tool in the sense that uh, you need to be transparent, as Paolo said, measuring and reporting. And for the future management of the company, I think it's essential with respect to the uh, environmental uh, and social dimension of the companies. We are talking about <clears throat> environment, safety, health, training of the people, ethics, growth and diversity. We need to be more diverse in terms of background, you know, in terms of gender, if we want to be a, you know, more leader, more creative and more innovative. So I think this is essential for the future management of the companies and uh, I think BV, you know, we are a private and listed company. For the past two years now we have had an ESG a program and policy and I can tell you we are seeing the very positive effects. So, very, very supportive. And George. Thank you. I think ESG is a, a useful tool which was initially abused as a platform to greenwash and with great aspirations and levels of expectation, which we've now come to realize was the wrong way of using the ESG. Uh, 
the environmental part of it, I think, is a little generational. My father would throw the cigarette out of the window. I would put the cigarette out in the ashtray. My son doesn't smoke. You, so environmentally, generationally, I think we're going to resolve that quite easily. On the social aspect part of it, there's a Greek, and Greek ship owner, long family history. We do have the social aspect. We care for our people because they're usually all family members from the same island. We all know each other as a family. And look at the Greeks. We have more women in our industry than I think any other industry. The chairman of the Union of Greek Ship Owners, the two largest ship owners are, are women. We have in our company 36% women in all levels of management. So on the social aspect of it, I think Greeks are doing quite well. On the governance, it's interesting because it will help family companies transform into corporate structures. And I think this is very useful for us because we need to become corporate as opposed to the traditional Greek family shipping company without losing the passing the company over from generation to generation, something that we've handled here in Greece surprisingly well because we pass the companies to the worthy as opposed to the entitled. And that way we've been able to keep companies alive for so many generations. So ESG as such for Greek shipping is something that we've embraced for generations. And I think it just needs to put it down on paper. And that's what we're doing at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, George. So ladies and gentlemen, I think you have it all. What is the problem today and what it will be tomorrow and in the next uh, 50 years and perhaps more. Unless there is uh, a, a final statement of any of my uh, colleagues here, I thank them and I thank you and please uh, give your applause uh, to this. Uh,